And we're going to start out with one of the one of the greatest evangelists in long-term history of the world. But yet, you'll find that what it appears is he wasn't extremely effective as an evangelist. But just because things appear that way don't mean it's true. The days of Noah. In Luke chapter 17, the Bible says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I pray, dear God, as we share this message, dear God, that you'll speak to our hearts. And dear God, it will challenge us. Dear God, that we'll be challenged by you, but also be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. And when we look at the world conditions today, we're prone to ask, are we living in the last days? And that's obviously a, it's a question that we'll ask, and things that we see point to that, obviously. The things that we see, the signs of the time, they, they point to this being the last days before the return of Christ. In the New Testament, there are 300 prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ. There are 300 prophecies concerning the last days that we are in. The last days actually would be the time from the, the, when Jesus ascended to the time when he comes back. Those are what the last days indicate. So the last days began in the very end of Jesus' journey on this earth. And Jesus gave signs of the time and before his return. And the most intriguing sign that he gave, we find in what we just read in Luke chapter 26. Or excuse me, uh, Luke chapter 17. He says that a sign of the times, a sign of the last days is the days of Noah. And the purpose of the signs is not to predict his return. For no one knows the day or the hour. That's not what it's to predict. It's not to do that. It's not to predict his return. But the purpose of prophetic signs is to reassure us that God is still in control. And to be watchful and ready for his return. In other words, we see the things taking place. We see what's going on in Israel. We see this and we know that as being a sign of the time. We know that as being a sign of the last days. We understand that as being those signs. But that's not so that we can be disappointed, but so that we can be pointed toward Him. So that we understand that even though bombs may be going off in Israel, that even though, that as their leaders have said, that this is their 9-11, so to speak, that even though that's taken place, and we should be praying for them, that God is still in control. And what He wants from us is for us to serve Him and for us to be ready for Him and so that people would be pointed toward Him during these last days. Another purpose for the prophecies, and that's a key purpose, is to evangelize a lost world. It's to evangelize a world that needs Him. So what, what were the days of Noah like? Let's go back to the account of Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. Noah's generation, they were swept away by the great flood. And Noah's name means comfort. And we don't know when the flood occurred. We don't know how many people lived. We don't know the population of the earth. The, the Garden of Eden, where man was created, was between the Tigris and the Euphrates. It was... That area that was modern day Mesopotamia, there, there had been no rain. They understand there had been no rain on the earth before Noah. There had been no rain during Noah's life. In fact, what happened is the water that they got, there was a constant mist all the time. And that mist covered the earth. But it wasn't rain like we experience where, where, where we see the rain come down and it comes down heavy or what have you. That, that, that we see that they never had that. But God warned of a flood and told Noah, build an ark. And we know that story. And Noah preached to the people. He preached to the people for 120 years. Noah preached the same 
sermon. We think we get bored with sermons if, 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 if there's ever one repeated. These people heard the same sermon for 120 years. That, 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 that he was preaching to them. And, and, and they were given that same thing, that same warning. And what we also know was people lived longer before the flood. Before the flood took place, people lived longer. You know, we find that, you know, Methuselah lived to be 969 years. Jared lived to be 962 years. Adam lived to be 950 years. I mean, people lived a long time. They lived a whole lot longer than, than we do now. That, and that we find through history and through study that scientific um, evidence suggests and actually lets us know that there was a great flood that covered the earth. Geologists have discovered that. Even different cultures and different religions believe that there was a great flood story. But what we find about Noah is Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord during an evil time. But what do we learn? What do we learn? And, and, and these are the things. What, why am I sharing with you this today? We know that's an old story. I want, we want to talk today about what can we learn from this prophecy that Jesus gives us and says, the days of Noah. What can we learn today? How does that apply to us today? Well, let's look. The first thing that, we, that it points us to is the condition of man. The condition of man or the condition of humanity. In Genesis chapter 6, it says this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now here's the condition of man. And let's see if this may sound similar to today. The condition of man near Noah's time that caused God to look upon them and had that I'm going to destroy man. The condition of man started this way, that man accepted sin as normal. And not just accepted it as normal, that man didn't just accept sin as normal. It was like, okay, it's all right that we sin. You see, that's, that's how man walked around. You know what? It's okay. It's okay if you, if you live wrong. It's okay if you do the terrible things. It's okay. You, know, you understand? They didn't have the Ten Commandments given to them at this time. But they had God's direction. And they knew man had already been placed in him the understanding of what was right and what was wrong. They knew to do right, but yet they were doing wrong. And man still said, you know what? It's okay if we do wrong. In other words, they, they said, it's okay if we murder folks. It's okay if we commit fornication. It's okay if we commit adultery. They said, it's okay if we lie, if we cheat, if we steal. It's okay if we hate people. It's okay if we, if we show hatred toward, toward people just because they're different from us. You see, that was the way it was in the days of Noah. It's okay if we indulge ourselves in sexual sin. That's, that's the days of Noah. Now, is there any parallel to today? You see, we find we live in a society, in a world that has become so permissive that we accept sin as normal. That we, we, don't know, we no longer want to talk about sin. We don't want to talk about the things that are ungodly because we might offend somebody if we say the wrong thing and we talk about the wrong thing or we talk about something that, 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 that maybe somebody's doing. They're afraid that, 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 that we're getting on them when it is really conviction that's getting on them and they don't want to hear it anymore. Here's the reality. The number one problem we face today, it's not what's taking place in Israel. The number one problem that we face today is not taking place in Washington, D.C. or Little Rock or at the hands of the politicians. The number one problem that we face today is still the problem of sin. Accepting things that are wrong and making them right. 
So it gets quiet when we start talking about sin. And we get afraid that somebody's going to, to deal with that. Well, every one of us are sinners. And we have to deal with that sin. We have to deal with those things. Yes, we're not going to live perfect. No one's going to live perfect. And no one's going to live sinless. But we can't accept sin as normal. Should we accept murder as normal? Of course not. Should we accept child abuse as normal? Of course not. We can't accept sin as normal. And, and, and that's where we see it. We, 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 that's the days of Noah. That's the days we see today. That's the problem that we, it's the number one problem still facing us. Well, what's another problem that we see in the world today that was like the days of Noah? It is violence has engulfed the world. We are living in a, such a violent time that, 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 that people can be so violent with one another. People are so angry and so ready to get even. They, 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 they want to fight at the drop of a hat and they'll drop a hat to fight. And it's the ugliest time that seemingly we've ever seen. And it's not just happening with, with people on the streets and drug addicts and drug dealers. They're not the only ones that are walking in violence. We have a world filled with violence. We have it accepted as normal. Whatever happened to following the words of Jesus when he says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Whatever happened to the words of Jesus when he said to turn the other cheek. Have those words changed or do they still exist? Of course they still exist. But we live in a world filled with violence. And it's accepted as normal. What about a day of wars and rumors of war? Well that's never been more true than it is today, right? We're living, the Bible tells us that, that, that there were wars were ended in the days of Noah. There were wars and rumors of wars. And we have that. And the Bible says that will mark us till the end of time. Oh, but this is another one that's really key. As the days of Noah, they didn't listen to God's word. Well, that's a heavy one right there. You see, we can tune out. The message is in the Word of God. We decide we want to tune it out. If it doesn't fit us, if, it, if the Word of God and, and God's messages don't tickle our ears, we want to tune it out. I haven't come to preach the gospel so I could have applause. I haven't come to preach the gospel so somebody can pat me on the back and say, good sermon. I, I, I could care less about any of those things. I want to preach the truth of the gospel, whether it offends or doesn't offend. In fact, Jesus said that you are going to be offended because of me. And we are supposed Can I tell you something? I, I want you to be very clear. If you are feeling comfortable right now that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, what I'm called to do, I'm not called to make people feel comfortable. I'm called to preach the truth of the gospel. Come on, come on. We can't walk around feeling comfortable. We need to come and feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. When I walk in church, I want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel comfortable. I want to feel conviction. I want to feel something that makes me want to go repent. I've had a week of a living in a world. I want to come to the house of God and, and be free from the world. And from the world that holds me down. Noah preached righteousness and they didn't listen. They were unmoved by the warning of judgment. You'll hear a little bit more about that. They were given a promise of grace and a warning of judgment, but these people were unmoved by it. That's the condition of mankind. And it's the condition today. So you have three things concerning the days of Noah, the condition of man, but then also the heart of God. And that's incredibly important. We see the heart of God. 
The heart of God was not to destroy man. He didn't want to destroy his creation. It says here in, in Genesis 6, it says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. We, we have to understand, when, when, when we read this and we look at this, when, when we say he's sorry, what, what God, God was sorrowful that man had turned his back on the Creator. He created man so that man would walk with him. So that man would live in fellowship with him. He created man because that's what he wanted. He, he, he wanted to have fellowship with man. And, 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 and God's heart was sorrowful over, over the way man acted. If he, you know, we get disappointed sometimes when our children let us down, don't we? And, 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 and now we don't want to abandon our children. You wouldn't abandon your children for anything when they let you down. But you, have you ever felt sorrowful? Absolutely you have. And, 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 but you don't give up on them, right? God said, well, God, gave, God did not give up on man. In fact, God gave opportunity after opportunity and, and for, for man. And, and, and so we learned two truths about God in the story of Noah. And one, that God's heart was filled with absolute pain. It hurt God. And it still hurts God when man doesn't abide by his laws. It hurts God when we reject Him. When somebody has an opportunity for salvation and they don't accept that opportunity for salvation, God is hurt. It grieves Him, the Bible says. But in this, we also know that God relented and sent His judgment. We need to also understand, as much as it hurts God, God is going to be the one to judge man. It's always going to be God that judges man. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be anybody else. It's not going to be judged on social media. Man's not going to be judged by the, by, 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 by the, by the thoughts of, of, of other men. Man is going to be judged by God. And, and, and God is going to give judgment. And, and at the end of the day, here's what's going to happen. When it comes to the very end, we're going to be judged. And we're either going to be in hell or we're going to be in heaven. Now, God's got his judgment, and the judgment goes both ways. But and, and as God, even though God relents to the judgment of hell, but he delights in salvation. When somebody gets saved, he delights in it. And that's why it's so important. That's why you hear me talk about it so often. That it is the heart of God not to destroy man, but to save man. Micah chapter 7, it says this, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of His heritage? That's what God wants to do. He wants to pardon sinners. He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's what God wants to do. 2 Peter says this, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody saved. That's right. But what about this? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that, 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 that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They say, that's the God we serve. That's the heart of God. The heart of God. He, 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 he's going to, according to His Word, He's going to judge. He has, he has put Himself in the parameters that He has got to be the judge because He's made Himself in that way. He's made Himself to be that judge. But He also wants so badly for everybody that hears about Him. He wants so badly for everybody to know Him. He wants for for you to know him. He wants for those people, those terrorists, he wants them to repent and to know him. He wants the, the, the people who are uh, who are on, on death's doorstep right now who never accept him. He wants to give them another shot so that they can know him. He, that's his mercy and that's his grace. A couple of years ago, 
and I'm a volunteer chaplain at the hospital. I was called to come up to the hospital. It was during the height of COVID, and I was called to go up to the hospital, and they asked if I could, they, 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 originally they, they, they asked if I could come up there and pray with this woman. She was in her 80s. She was on her deathbed. She was from Kennet. She never passed her. And I went in there to, to her room and, and, um, and, and, and got to pray with this woman and, and talking to her. And, and, and she had her family. She had her kids with her. And, you know, they, they thought she was going to die that day. And, and as, I, as I talked to them, I said, look, I said, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? And she said, no. I said, would you like to give your heart to the Lord? She was on her deathbed, as most of us would look at. And, and she did. She gave her heart to the Lord that it was, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, and she gave her heart to the Lord, and, and, and I remember her giving her heart to the Lord that day, and it was such a blessing, and I went back about my business, and about three weeks later, I got a call. She was still in the hospital. She's still, she's still alive. She's been in the hospital. They said, Mama wants to know if you can baptize her. I said, well, I was I can bring her up here to she's in the hospital. She's she is dying. And, and so I, I said, well, I said, you know, we believe in immersion, but I'm gonna have to go a different route here because there's no way I, I, I had the ability to do this, but she'd given her heart to the Lord and she wanted to be baptized. So we got a got a, one of those buckets that they give people, put all this stuff in and filled it with water and 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 right there in her hospital bed, you know, I baptized that dear lady and then uh, you know, a week or so later, she passed away, and I went to Kennet and performed this woman's um, funeral. But, but here's the thing. What, what I see in this, it, it, all I got to be was just a vessel. I got to be the one to, 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 to take her that gospel. But, but the key is, what with this, it was God's mercy and God's grace. I said, you know what? This woman who needed Jesus... Before she enters eternity, I'm going to give her another chance. I'm going to give her another chance. That's the heart of God. I know that there are people who are killed instantly in accidents. I, know, I understand that. And I know that maybe not everybody gets that last chance. But the grace and the mercy of God it, it just it never ceases to amaze me. That, that, that I got to go and preach this dear lady's funeral a, a few weeks after I got to meet her for the very first time because this woman had given her heart guard because of God's mercy and God's grace. You see, he never sees this time. You know, we can pray for a thousand people and they'll get healed in their body from cancer, from heart disease, from diabetes, but nothing is as important as somebody who gives their heart to Jesus Christ. That's the heart of God. We have the condition of man. We have the heart of God. Then we have the faith of Noah. It says in verse 8 of Genesis 6, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. Perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now, when the Bible says perfect, what do you mean that Noah was completely a perfect person? But what this is identifying him kind of like Job, the way Job was identified, is that he had faith. He lived for God. Even in this imperfect world, as an imperfect human, he had a faith that caused him to walk for God. Noah walked with God. He wasn't in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't, he, he was born after sin had came into the world. But what a powerful description that the word gives us of Noah's relationship with God. And what Noah did, and this is where his faith met his walk, is Noah decided that he was going to be a witness with his life. Now, now you got to look at this. He continued to preach God's message of hope while he's building this boat for 120 years. While he's building this boat, Noah's preaching. You see, I don't 
believe the boat building was his number one job. Preaching was his number one job. Boat building was his side job. Yeah, people come and go, why are you building a boat? We don't have a lake here. We don't have an ocean here. Why are you building a boat? It's going to rain. They don't even know what rain is. Water's going to come from the sky. And life ain't. But why is it going to? And Noah's telling them the whole time. Because of your sins. Because of your sins, you are damning yourself to hell. And that's what he's telling them. He was faithful to witness of God's grace, but he was faithful to live as a witness of God's grace. And, and that's what we see. I mean, I, I can imagine. Again, let's, let's, let's look at today. If somebody ridicules me for what I say, the tendency for, for, for me would be, you know what, let me just get, let me, let, let, let me, let me just get, get, get all up and in a roar and, 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 and say, you know what, somebody ridiculed me because I preached, somebody ridiculed me because of something I said while I was preaching, and I could get, I could get myself stirred up and, and want to just go back and I want to respond and, and say, oh, you people, you don't know what you're talking about, and I can go on social media, I can go on Facebook, I can go on X, I can go on all these different things, and I can tell them, I can just go ahead and start Casting dispersions on people, or I can be like Noah. I'm going to preach the gospel. People are going to ridicule me, and I'm still going to do it because I'm not here to please man. We're here to please God. And God had given him direction, and His message never changed. Did he get frustrated? I'm sure he got frustrated. I'm sure he's like everybody got frustrated, but he continued to be a witness. Here's what we've got to have. We talk about evangelism. If you want to see people saved, we've got to experience what we find. And I believe Noah had a, a touch of this in his life. In Acts chapter 1, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, to the end of the earth. Listen, if you want to be a witness to somebody, let the Holy Ghost fill your life. Yes. Too many times, instead of us wanting the Holy Ghost, we want the byproducts. We want the things that make us feel good because the Holy Ghost is in us. You know what I'm talking about. Those of you that, that really have a Pentecostal background, you understand it? And, you know, I, cause I understand what it's like the first time I came in to the church of God and the first time I saw things that made me, that made me go, huh? And I wasn't sure about some of those things. And I, I didn't know about everything. And, 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 you know, we tend to focus on those things. We tend to focus on the manifestations. And thank God for the manifestations. We want to focus on the shout. God bless us for the shout. I thank God for the shout. We want to focus on the we, we want to focus on the dance and, and maybe we, we dance in the spirit or, or something like that or, or or maybe something that oh I, I'll never do that. I remember I, I saw people when I first time I got saw people dancing around the altars. I thought, what on earth are these people doing? And I said, I'll I said, I can be a part of this, but I said, I'll never do this. I said, I'll never do that. But one time I was in a revival service and, and you know, somebody had, had done something. Somebody had, had, had blessed me. They had, uh, before service started, we were young married couple, had two small kids and, uh, and, and, and somebody came to me before service and, and handed me a hundred dollar bill. And I, I put it in my pocket. I should have put it in my wallet, but I put it in my pocket. And I, I remember this revival and, 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 and I had, you know, I, I said, you know, I don't need to do that. I mean, let, let other people do that. Let people who have rhythm dance in the spirit. And I knew I, God don't ask if you got rhythm or not. He don't care. And, and, and so, at this particular service, I, I, I got to, I got to, um, Sister Patricia, I got to dance. I don't know what it looked like. They didn't have video cameras to video people doing stuff like that. And by the way, we cut video off for altar service. So it would, and I, I had no idea what it looked like. All I know is I, I, as I got done, I remember I lifted my hands and all of a sudden I felt somebody put something in my hand. 
And, 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 and they closed my hand on it. And it felt like a piece of money. I thought, well, good. I done got blessed again. And Brother DeCanter was there. Y'all remember Brother DeCanter? Brother DeCanter was there. He whispered in my ears. He said, Brother, you shook $100 out of your pocket. Aren't you glad I'm the one that found it? Put it back in my hand. You know, thank God for an honest preacher. I didn't get blessed again, but I did get blessed and I didn't, that I didn't lose it. I, I felt good. It felt good. Not the money, but, the, but the, it felt good. But that's not the intention of the Holy Ghost is for us to feel good. The Holy Ghost is not here for our enjoyment, but He is here for our employment. In other words, He is here to fill us so that we can be witnesses. And hear this, and hear this preacher this morning. If we receive the filling of the Holy Ghost and we refuse to be witnesses, He will remove the blessing from us. Yes. Noah was a witness from the music place. And Noah won as many people as he could. Now, don't you hear this very closely? We get so locked in the numbers so many times. And I'm like everybody else. I do too. In 120 years of preaching the same message, we only have evidence that Noah won seven people. Can you imagine? I don't know how many people lived in Noah's neighborhood. I don't know how many people lived in the, the country where he was at. I don't know how many people, but you know, word had to spread about him building this boat. Then people came and in and, and 120 years, he won seven people to God. Now you would sit there and think, well, what kind of preacher is that? He said, we get wrapped up in the numbers. We get wrapped up into those things. Do you know what it was? He won enough people to give the human race a shot at redemption. If he doesn't win those seven people, his wife, his three sons, his three daughters-in-law, if he doesn't win those, Jesus never comes. If Noah had been the only person on that ark, Man never gets redemption. So you can credit the two and a half billion Christians on the planet today as Noah's converts. All he did was obey God. Do what God called him to do. In a time, in a time where man wouldn't listen to God, Noah listened to God. 2023, in a time where it seems man doesn't listen to God, will you listen to God? Will you follow God's word? And Noah became such a powerful instrument that he's listed in Hebrews 11 the, the hall of faith where it says by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith while our words are powerful it's our life that backs up the message. And here, I want you to hear this. I want to share with you just a little thing I read. It's called sermons that we see. It's not always the sermons that we hear, it's sermons that we see. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is better, a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing. 
but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. <coughs> the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might understand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Would you stand to your feet? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I have shared, dear God, the word that you've laid on my heart. Lord, to provide this emphasis and dear God, to remind us of our condition, of your heart, and the faith that we can have. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. There's two evidences of carrying a witness in this world today. The first evidence starts from what you say, yes. But it's always backed up with what we do. The world is watching us. How do we respond to this world? To the evil we see. To the ugliness we see. How do we respond to it? How do we respond to it? Here's what I want to ask you right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you this. Would you be honest? How many of you are concerned about the conditions you see in the world today? Hold your hand. We should be. How many of you believe that God hasn't given up on the world? Do you believe God hasn't given up? I believe God hasn't given up. How many of you feel like, let's be honest, you feel like, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm adequate to be able to win people. Be honest. Hold your hands. I don't feel like I'm at it. Build it. None of us are at it. None of us are at it. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I'll pray for any need you have. But if you're able... You're concerned about the condition of this world. Would you just come and stand at this altar, us together, for just a minute? We want, I want to pray. I believe that God is going to not just make you adequate. God's going to equip you. His word promises equipping. He gives us equipping. It, it is a beautiful thing as we allow God to equip us. Everybody has a different group that they're called to reach. There are some people who will never, who will never hear me because I can't connect to them. That you can connect to. That you'll be able to connect to. There, there's some people that you'll be able to connect to. I'll never be able to connect to. And there's something you'll be able to connect to that I, that, or that I'll be able to connect to that you'll never be able to connect to. That's okay. That's okay. But here's what I do know is this. I know that God can use you. I'm concerned about this world as much as anybody is. I'm concerned about every bit of it from, 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 from the sin to politics to the, to the direction of the nation to the, to the wars to the violence 
to the to, to the to the sexual sins that are out there. I'm, I'm concerned about all of it. All of it concerns me. But I also know that God hasn't given us multiple messages. He's given us one message. Just one message. And that message we find from the words of John the Baptist where he said this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. That's it. Repent. I want to pray with everybody right now. And I just want us to all do this first. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Jesus. We, love you. we love you. But today we repent today. of any sin, anything that keeps us from you. Today, Lord, we know we turn away from those things. We turn to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you, God, for your grace, your grace on my life, and your grace on my family, your grace on the church. Thank you, God. We love you. We know that we can affect change in this world by just living for you and sharing with others. In Jesus' name, we repent. Now, I want you to stretch your hands this way. God has laid on my heart to impart this into you. He wants me to impart this into you. What it means to impart it, 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 it's a transference of a, of a spiritual thing. And he's laid this on my heart. We feel inadequate. God wants you to feel inadequate because he wants you to rely on him. Amen. But as I pray for you right now, I'm going to pray that God gives you the strength, the boldness, the love, and the compassion to be able to reach whoever it is that you need to reach. That, 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 that you will be able to do that. Whether it be somebody at work, somebody at home, somebody at school, somebody somebody that, 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 that you are friends with, a neighbor, or just somebody that you just come in contact with. God, in the name of Jesus right now, I pray the strength over each one of these right now that, God, we impart in them the desire and dear God, the ability and equipping for them to share you, for them to be a witness, dear God, a witness of your saving grace, that God, they can be a witness of the heart of God in their lives and the heart of God for others. God, today I pray that you would give them in their hearts opportunities to come across people. In the name of Jesus. Here, I want to ask you to pray something right now. I want you to pray. I want you to ask God to this week not put somebody in your way. Put anyone in your way. You see, somebody, you get to pick and choose, but anyone, it might be the waitress you see at the restaurant today. It might be somebody at the gas station. It might be somebody that shows up at your house unexpectedly. I want to ask you to pray right now. God, would you put anyone in my path that I can minister to, that I can witness to, that I can share with, that you would put them in my path in person, put them in my path on social media, Put them in my path on the phone. Put them in my path wherever they may be. Put anyone in my path. And I will share with them the message of Noah. The message of John the Baptist. The message of salvation. In the name of Jesus. Right now, would you just begin to pray for somebody that, that, that God would lay on, that God's already laid on your heart of somebody that needs salvation. God's laid on your heart somebody that you need to pray for. Would you call their name in prayer? 
Would you begin doing that?